What's up guys, I'm Ira Rochelle and this is Nuggets of Truth. One of the most uncomfortable topics in the church today is the topic of the gifts of the Holy Spirit. Many people in the church today believe that the gifts of the Holy Spirit are no longer for us today. They say that these gifts were for the first church. It was for the time of the apostles like Paul, but they're not for us. In fact, they go as far as to preach against those who seek these gifts of the Spirit. Now, here's the interesting thing. Those who preach against the gifts of the Spirit and try to stop others from seeking those gifts, they never seem to preach against the gift of salvation for all people. What am I talking about? Acts chapter 2, verse 17 through 21. And in the last days it shall be, God declares, that I will pour out my Spirit on all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. Even on my male servants and female servants in those days I will pour out my Spirit, and they shall prophesy. And I will show wonders in the heavens above, and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and vapor of smoke. The sun shall be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the day of the Lord comes, the great and magnificent day. And it shall come to pass that everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Did you catch what follows the pouring out of the Spirit? Let's read that one more time. Verse 21. And it shall come to pass that everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. We claim this verse, we preach this verse, we encourage with this verse, yet we ignore what comes before. The Spirit was poured out upon all flesh first. Without first having the pouring out of the Spirit that brought prophecy and dreams and visions and all of the spiritual gifts, then we wouldn't have salvation for all who call upon the name of the Lord. In fact, the same people that preach against the gifts of the Spirit, they never actually preach against the armor of God. And did you know that the armor of God includes the most important gifts of the Spirit that they preach against? Let's read that real quick. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 17 through 18. And take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, praying at all times in the Spirit with all prayer and supplication. Notice what Paul says comes from the sword of the Spirit. Let's backtrack for a minute. Let's lay a little bit of a foundation first. Paul says that the sword of the Spirit is the Word of God. What is the Word of God? Whenever we hear the Word of God, we automatically think about the physical Bible that we hold in our hands and that's it. We don't think about the fact that the Word of God is so much more than just our physical Bible. The Word of God is Jesus. It's so much more than just the physical Bible that you hold in your hand. It's the son of the living God. John chapter 1 verse 14 says, And the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen his glory, glory as the only son from the Father, full of grace and truth. Who is the son of God? Well, Matthew chapter 16, 15 through 17 says, He said to them, But who do you say that I am? Simon Peter replied, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered him, Blessed are you, Simon Bar-Jonah, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. Jesus was and is and always will be the Son of God. So then if Jesus is the Word of God, then would it not make sense that then the Word of God would be Jesus, if this is our spiritual weapon? Here's what I'm getting at. Whenever Jesus said that something spiritual or supernatural was going to happen, what did he say? He said, when they do it in my name. Why? Because quoting the scripture alone isn't enough. Even the devil quotes the scripture. It's about what name you're quoting that scripture in. It's about the name that you pray in, the name that you ask in. It's about the name of Jesus. Why? Because all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to Jesus according to Matthew 28 verse 18. So the sword of the spirit isn't just the literal physical Bible. It's so much more than that. It's communicating with God. How can we be sure? Well, first, it's the only piece of spiritual armor that comes after 
the helmet of salvation. It's the only spiritual weapon that needs to have that seal of protection that is the Holy Spirit, which is why it is the sword of the Spirit. Second, look what Paul says immediately after defining what the sword of the Spirit is. Ephesians chapter 6 verse 18. Praying at all times in the Spirit with all prayer and supplication. It seems that the way to use the sword of the Spirit is only activated through prayer. And as I said earlier, our prayers are only answered through the name of Jesus. So the sword of the Spirit is activated specifically by communicating with God through the name of Jesus. And according to Paul, the first thing to truly activate the sword of the Spirit is praying at all times in the Spirit. So what does that mean? If you notice, Paul differentiates praying in the Spirit and regular prayer. In fact, when writing to the Corinthians, Paul explains that when he's praying in the Spirit, his mind isn't fruitful, but his Spirit is. So he also prays with his mind that his mind might be fruitful as well. Let's read that real quick. 1 Corinthians 14, 14 through 15. For if I pray in a tongue, my spirit prays, but my mind is unfruitful. What am I to do? I will pray with my spirit, but I will pray with my mind also. I will sing praise with my spirit, but I will sing with my mind also. So according to Paul, arguably the greatest apostle who ever lived, to pray in the spirit is very different than regular prayer. So if the sword of the spirit is the word of God, which is Jesus, meaning whatever you quote or ask in his name will come to pass, then would it not tend to reason that because we no longer pray in the spirit and so we no longer build up our spirit, we no longer see miracles as the early church once did? Here's what I'm getting at. If we go back to the disciples, they were casting out demons in the name of Jesus until they came to one specific spirit that they couldn't cast out. After Jesus cast out the spirit in this boy, he tells his disciples privately that they couldn't cast out the specific spirit because of the lack of faith. But look what else he tells them. Matthew 17 verse 20. He said to them, Because of your little faith, for truly I say to you, if you have the faith of a grain of mustard seed, you will say to this mountain, move from here to there, and it will move, and nothing will be impossible for you. The disciples had some kind of faith. We know this because they were surprised when they couldn't cast out the demon. They were confused why they couldn't do it. They had done it many times before, but this one time they couldn't get it. So they had some form of faith, but they lacked a specific kind of faith. If we go to Mark's account, we find what kind of faith they were missing. Mark chapter 9 verse 29. And he said to them, this kind cannot be driven out by anything but prayer. They were missing the spiritual connection that only comes through prayer. Look how Paul defines it in Romans chapter 10 verse 17. So faith comes from hearing and hearing through the word of Christ. Notice how it doesn't say through the word of God. He says through the word of Christ. They lacked a faith that isn't just your average I believe kind of faith. It isn't just your I believe and I will do kind of faith. It's a faith based on relationship through Jesus. If you keep reading and you get to the book of Acts and the spirit comes down on those in the upper room and they're filled with the power of, of God, you see something specifically happen to them. They begin to speak in tongues. After that event, never again do they have to ask, why couldn't we do this? Because they began to do greater things than even Jesus did. People were being healed by their shadows. People were healed and demons casted out by handkerchiefs that had touched them. Literal, physical chains were falling off of their wrists and ankles and literal, physical cell doors were being unlocked and opened. They had unlocked something. They had unlocked the sword of the spirit, the weapon that they used in and through the name of Jesus, the weapon that they had just a little taste of while Jesus was on earth, but wasn't fully able to wield. So many today ask why we no longer see miracles or signs and wonders. Well, 
could it be because we are no longer praying in the spirit? So we no longer have full access to the sword of the spirit? The scripture says that God is spirit and those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. John chapter 4 verse 24. Did you notice that it doesn't say that they will worship or that they can or that one day it will be possible? No, it says that those who worship God must worship him in spirit and in truth. As Christians, it's our duty to pray in the spirit. It's our duty to communicate with God through the spirit so that our spirit may be built up and not only our mind. We aren't seeing miracles take place because our spirit is so weak. We aren't seeing demons flee in the name of Jesus because our spirit can't wield the sword. Look at what Jesus said to Peter in the garden before he was arrested. Matthew 26 verse 41. Watch and pray that you may not enter into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. Jesus told Peter to watch and pray. Why? Because the spirit was willing, but the flesh was weak. Peter had to first build up his spirit so that he could overcome his weak flesh. We have a desire to see miracles and to see signs and wonders, but unless our spirit is strengthened, unless our spirit is strong enough to wield the sword of the spirit, we won't be able to see these miracles. We won't see signs and wonders unless we first build up our spirit. And the only way to build up our spirit is to pray in the spirit. Why? Because the spirit doesn't speak our earthly languages. Our spirit speaks in heavenly tongues. Therefore, in order to minister to your spirit, you have to speak the language of your spirit. You have to grow close enough to God that you become worthy of picking up his sword of the spirit. So to put it into human terms, if you've ever seen the movie Thor, it's like Thor's hammer. Now, Thor's hammer can't just be picked up by anyone. You have to be worthy of the power of Thor's hammer in order to pick it up and wield it. This is the same with the sword of the spirit. You have to be worthy of the sword of the spirit in order to pick it up and wield it. Imagine if God gave every single person the right to wield the sword of the spirit. We would use it for our own pride, just as Thor did with his hammer at the beginning of the movie. Why? Because he was a child in his thinking as we are. Until we begin to feed our spirit and it begins to grow, we will be unworthy to even pick up the sword of the spirit, let alone wield it with all of its great power and authority. So let's just sum everything up for you guys. The sword of the spirit isn't just the physical word of God that we refer to as the Bible. It's not just quoting scripture. It's quoting scripture in Jesus's name through the power of the Holy Spirit. This power of the Holy Spirit can only be activated through praying in the spirit because your spirit can only be built up through praying in the spirit just as your mind can only be built up through praying with your mind the church today no longer sees the miracles of the early church the first church because the church today rarely prays in the spirit when we start to pray in the spirit we will begin to activate the sword of the spirit but praying in the spirit only opens the door We must also pray with our mind as well so that our mind may be built up as well as supplication. Which, you know, maybe we'll go into deeper in another video for what those two next steps mean. I hope you guys enjoyed this video and I hope that it answered a few questions about the sword of the spirit as well as praying in the spirit that you might have had. And if you did enjoy this video, please feel free to like, comment, share, and subscribe to our channel. And until next time... God bless.